Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, we see folks are still dialing in, so we are going to get started in just a second. And stay with us. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our presentation, Listen to the People Using Social Media as a Channel for Feedback and Opinions. Today we have Beth Malaski, the Media Coordinator from Queen Anne's County, Maryland, joining us to talk about this important topic. Before we get started, I want to cover a couple of housekeeping items. First, all attendees are on mute, but there will be time for question and answer following the presentation. So please feel free to use the question function to submit your questions on the control panel that you see in the GoToWebinar function. Following the webinar, we'll be following up with you with resources you can reference as um, you dive deeper into what Beth is talking about today. So what's on the agenda for today? First, we're gonna hear from Beth as she talk about how she uses social media to get feedback and opinions. And then Anil Chavla, the CEO and founder of Archive Social, will be joining us to talk about legal policy and record keeping on social media. Over the past couple of weeks, I've gotten to know Beth really well. I've had a really good time chatting with her about how she uses social media and specifically some of the awesome things she does to gain insight into her community and avoid those surveys. And I don't know about you all, but I open up my email at least once a week and I see that, hey, feedback wanted headline and I immediately click delete in my inbox. So that's found some interesting ways to work around that survey fatigue and we'll be hearing about that in a second. But first a little about Beth. So Beth Malaski is a Maryland certified emergency manager and public information officer for Queen Anne's County, Maryland. She's been working as a government professional for over 15 years, specializing in emergency management and public information. During the first 10 years of her career, she worked in four states and served a year with AmeriCorps. Her unique experiences include everything from taking 911 calls to training as an air medical dispatcher to teaching kindergarten classes and what should go in an emergency supply kit. After realizing that emergency management was the path she wanted for her career, she started full time with the Philadelphia Office of Emergency Management, where she was recruited into the External Affairs Division and started training as a public information officer. That is when she discovered her true passion. And then in 2014, she relocated back to Maryland and has been working in Queen Anne's County, developing, expanding their public information program. Beth, welcome today. Thanks. Thanks and for th having me. Yeah, thanks so much for, ha for joining us. And I'm going to go ahead and control, give you the controls all over to you so you can get started. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen yet? Yeah. Okay, so thanks for joining me today. Uh, thank you for that great introduction. My name is Beth Malaski and I work in Queen Anne's County, Maryland.
Hey, Beth, it appears we've lost the audio. Have you gone on mute? Am I back? There you are. Thank you. Okay. Uh, did you get any of that or should I start back over? You might need to start from the beginning. Okay. Um, thanks again. Sorry for that uh, little hiccup. I'm Beth Malaski. I work in Queen Anne's County, Maryland, and I'm going to talk to you guys today about how I use social media to get some feedback and opinions from our citizens and just a couple of tips. So whenever I participate in any kind of training or webinar, I really like to find out who the person is that's teaching, a little bit of their background and where it is they're working because it's really good to take that into consideration um, because not everything that works for me might work for you where you are. So about who I am, I am not a graphic artist, I'm not a writer or a journalist or a firefighter, a police officer or an emergency planner. I grew up in the 80s and 90s and I started out my career going to art school and doing interior design. Somehow I ended up at a 911 center as a dispatcher uh, in 2002, 2003. And like we said in the beginning, I've, I worked at a 911 center for about eight years in two different states before going into AmeriCorps and going into emergency management. So now I'm back in Maryland as the PIO. There I am in the 90s, right over there on the left. So Queen Anne's County, Maryland, if you're not familiar with where that is, uh, we have a little less than 50,000 people. We're nestled right in the Chesapeake Bay in between Delaware and Annapolis. And we are the thoroughway on the way to all the beaches in Maryland and Delaware. All of our fire departments are volunteer, but we do have paid EMS. And we have a sheriff's office and the state police that take care of our whole county as far as law enforcement and we have one town that has their own police department. So there we are right there in the Chesapeake Bay. So that just kind of gives you a little background of where I am and we're very rural here. So I start out my year with a plan. It's sort of my framework for the entire year for each department for their social media. I kind of pull out their uh, goals and themes and the story for that uh, department and then I break it down further into the months as you can see here um, and I, I use this all year long and I update it constantly. So once I go from there I take my FEMA toolkits which I get every month from the state and from FEMA and I start pulling out what kind of suggested things they have and then whatever week or month we might be celebrating I also go and pull their toolkits and look at that and then I also use archive social so I will pull what I posted last year so I can see if there's good content that I want to reuse and just to kind of take a look at um, how people reacted to it. So the tools that I use uh, for social media, I, I say use what you're comfortable with. So I hope you guys are not laughing too hard, but I do use PowerPoint to make a lot of my graphics. Like I said, I, was, I am not a graphic designer. I am using PicMonkey a little bit more now and getting more comfortable with it. They have a lot of great templates, uh, especially for the different um, platforms, uh, Snapchat stories, Instagram stories, different posts. To make videos, I use a program called Kyoza um, that you can take photos or slides and make them into a uh, video file. For my archive system, we use Archive Social. For my social media management program, I use Hootsuite. And I also use a really cool program called FlipSnack that takes brochures and turns them into one of those cool online brochures that you can hear the sound of the pages turning. Mostly we use that on our website, but occasionally I share them on social media as well. And just for networking and training, I am a member of government social media. Hello to any of my fellow gizmos out there. Um, I get information from their conferences, their Facebook group, and of course their website. So for my photos that I use in my graphics, I use a combination of places where I get them. I use a lot of my own personal photos because I know that I won't have any problems with uh, having to get signatures or permission. Um, I use photos that employees have sent me. I'll just go out and take the photo myself if it's something specific that I need. Um, I do use a number of copyright free sites to use uh, images and I like to use, we have live traffic cameras here in Maryland from the state and so I can use those for different um, traffic problems and then uh, Google Maps, I'll use the street view 
of Google Maps and take a screenshot of that and use those images as well. I try really hard never to steal photos from online without permission. I'm not saying I've never done it, but I try never to do it. So I'm gonna start with some of the things that have not worked for me and go into a little more detail. So um, just like we said in the beginning, surveys. Um, I, I am the same as Erica. I will get a survey monkey email in my email and half the time I delete it. Um, same thing with online. I found that as I was sharing surveys, every department wants us to, to put out surveys and we just really weren't getting the feedback. Um, posting a map to explain a detour. We got a lot of feedback from the public that our maps were not very easy to read. Um, events on Nextdoor. They don't seem to work the same way for us as Facebook events, and not a lot of people seem to see them or interact with them. And Sam, some pictures that refuse to turn. I'm not sure if anyone's gone and programmed social media and the picture is upright, and then once it goes and posts, it's sideways again. So a quick trick for those, I found that if you take the picture and import it into another program and make it into an entire new image file, you can get it to stay in the right direction. There's something with Samsung, the uh, data is really hard to override. And even if you turn it this way or that way, if you don't save it into a completely new file, um, that original data will still be there. So surveys, a survey that isn't a survey. So um, one of the first times that I tried doing something a little different with our surveys, was when we were updating our hazard mitigation plan. So I'm not sure if any of you are emergency management folks out there, and you know that part of updating your plan, you have to get feedback from the public. So in years past, we really didn't get a whole lot of uh, feedback from the public, so we tried something different. So first thing I used was, um, I used a recognizable landmark photo that our residents would would be able to see. So uh, this is an area in our county that often gets flooded. Um, we don't normally get hit direct from hurricanes, but we get the storm surge. And so we have a lot of flooding here. So this is a really popular restaurant area that um, was flooded pretty bad during, I think this picture is from Hurricane Isabel. So I use that as my main graphic for my hazard mitigation plan survey. And in this one, I did use the word survey. That is one thing that I would recommend that I found is better not to call it a survey, but in all the text that I put out to the public, I stressed the fact that I wanted their help, that we were updating this plan and we really needed their input and we really needed their help. So I used this graphic everywhere where I was trying to get the feedback from the public. So not only did I put it out on social, but I also had that same graphic on our website. So when I sent people to the website and they clicked on that image, it took them directly to the survey. Um, once we were done with the survey, then I replaced that link to the hazard mitigation section of the website. And you can see here, that's my um, flip snack online brochure. So I put all the results into one of those online brochures for people to look at. Made it a little bit more interesting. So here is another survey that we put out, and this time I didn't call it a survey at all. And I tried to use a couple um, additional graphics, not just the one. So I used a combination of graphics, interactive stories on Instagram and um, Snapchat, and also videos. And I tried to direct everyone back to the website again to fill out a form. Um, and I am gonna show you guys the video. Let me see if I can find it. I'm gonna show you guys the video that I made for this survey that was not a survey.
Okay, so um, like you can see there, that was a video that I made with the Kyoza program that I was talking about earlier. So I had a video that I could directly upload into social media. At the end of the video, it sent everyone to the website where I had a graphic that was recognizable from um, that you can see in the left-hand corner that was a combination of the four graphics I used that sent people to the survey. And on the next slide, I think I should have... So here's some of the other graphics that I used. Um, I used them as just a still graphic where people could make comments underneath the post, but I also used these in stories where I did the interactive pieces where people could actually type into the story um, their answers or answer yes or no. And I got most of these graphics from the copyright free, uh, copyright free sites. So you can see the interactive pieces um, I just I got a lot more feedback by trying all of these different methods. So it was the interactive pieces, the video, the separate graphics, um, not calling it a survey and just act, telling people that we needed their help. So this was for a hurricane evacuation study. We wanted to see how many people would actually leave if we called for an evacuation. And um, this is what the form looked like. I uh, filled this out on our website. So this is where it sent people. And I tried to uh, force everybody to the website. I did get some feedback from the interactive stories, which was, I didn't, it wasn't an overwhelming response on the stories. So they were easy to input into my Excel sheet. But once I put this, all of these graphics out and released all of this, within the first two hours, we had 190 responses, which is pretty impressive for, um, uh, for a survey, which we normally don't get a whole lot of movement on. So altogether, we only ended up getting 225 responses, but it was still uh, pretty successful. So here's a couple more of some of our interactive stories. I really have enjoyed playing around with the um, story feature on Instagram, and I seem to get a lot of um, a lot of feedback from them and a lot more eyes on my content. So. The one on the left is um, one where I used two things. I used um, a, a question poll type of thing where people could click on yes or no. We had a controversial project that we're working on right now. It's the 30th anniversary um, of a drug awareness program we had, and we wanted to change the name to update it to 2019. So the first part was just interactive should we change the name and then I made a form again on our website and when you swiped up the story you could uh, pick from uh, several suggestions or type in your own so if you are wondering about adding a URL to your stories on Instagram you have to be um, a business account first so you can set that up in your settings and then you have to reach out to our contacts at um, Facebook and Instagram to be verified. Once you have those two pieces done, then you will be able to add a URL to your stories. So that's that cool swipe up feature. So um, another thing that I like to use in our stories, if I find that we've been mentioned in any uh, publications, I go and see if they have an Instagram account, and then I use the mention sticker. So it can also be shared on their Instagram account, which just gets more eyes on your content. So for this one, a couple of our parks were mentioned in Washingtonian Magazine. So I mentioned them in the story, and then I attached the article to the swipe up feature. Um, another thing that works really well on your interactive stories are YouTube links. So anytime that we, our video department does a really neat video, I'll take a screenshot, advertise it in a story, and then when you swipe up, it takes you right to the YouTube link and plays the video. So here's a couple of other times that we've um, asked for help or uh, been keeping an eye on things that our citizens were asking from us. So the story on the left, um, I don't know how many of you guys have Facebook groups that are really active in your community. So we have a lot of those. Facebook is probably one of our more popular social media platforms here. And we had a lot of people talking about a strange smell down at our beaches. 
and they were sure that there was either dead bodies down there or the sewage uh, was leaking into the water. And so they were calling our public works department uh, nonstop about these complaints. So we saw that they were also getting a lot of phone calls and um, some our directors and county administrator asked us to put some information out uh, to let the people know what was going on. So we found out that it was actually rotting sea lettuce that was causing the smell. So we put some information out about exactly what the smell was, a nice picture there of of the sea lettuce and then when we shared it into our community groups I think I titled it what's that smell and then had this information underneath so it was really driven from not only uh, getting an overabundance of phone calls but also monitoring our our groups our community groups and seeing what people really wanted to know about another uh, post here on the right so this I did everything you're not supposed to do um, there's no photo um, it's a really just kind of dry uh, post, but we had a crash where the people had a um, their dog in the car and the dog had escaped when they were rescuing the people out of the car. And so we were asking for help looking for the dog. So this was one of the first times that we really went out there and were asking for input from the public. And you can see that the reach that I got from this post was almost the amount of people that live in this county. It was shared 726 times. And the difference I saw was that we were asking people for help. So I've used that a lot with my animal control department with uh, cases that they're working on and um, that seems to help really well and it helps them. So I mentioned my maps, that people didn't like my maps. Um, I never really thought that they were confusing, but um, once uh, several people told me that they just didn't make any sense, I thought, well, maybe I should show some pictures <clears throat> instead of a map. So if you go onto Google Maps and you see the little man and you drag him onto the street, you can see your street view. So I've been uh, using that and then just taking a snippet or a screenshot of that and using that in my postings for detours and um, road closures and it's been going over very well with the public um, they really like the fact that not only am, am I describing in the words where exactly um, the detour is what's going on when it's happening but then they also have a visual of exactly what it looks like um, as if they were driving down the road um, for crashes that are happening right at the moment that's when I will use our state um, traffic cameras and take a screenshot of that so they can actually see the backup and um, and that and that's been way more popular um, and interactive with the public than just using a map. So a couple other things that have worked for us: um, press releases. We used to put all of our press releases on Facebook, and we still occasionally do. They don't fit on Twitter. Um, for our other platforms, we typically put them on our website with a link and just a a small short. Uh, line of what it's about and an image and send them to the website to read the press release. But just purely by accident, um, we discovered that our press releases get a lot of action on Nextdoor. So some of the most dry content that we have, we will put it on Nextdoor and people read the entire thing, they interact with it. We're getting phone calls, replies, emails, all about whatever uh, press release we happen to put out. And we've just gotten a lot of really great feedback from that. So like I said earlier, the events didn't seem to work for us on Nextdoor, but it seems to be a really good uh, place for just news press releases. So another thing that has worked really well for us is the direct video uploads to Facebook. So this is a video that has to do with that controversial um, drug awareness program. So we had some historic footage from the 1989 project. So we did a throwback Thursday where we directly uploaded that news footage um, into Facebook. And you can see here, uh, it reached 17,000 people uh, for at least the first three seconds, 12,000 uh, views, which is pretty successful um, versus just a YouTube link. So that's uh, the other reason that I like to use that Kyoza program for the photos because I just seem to get a lot of uh, a lot of a lot more views when I directly upload the videos. And then another tip, since like I said, this was a very controversial project that we're working on, we had a mixture of positive and negative comments. 
So I have a pretty extensive list of of words that are not allowed on our Facebook pages that Facebook will automatically hide. And I don't ever worry about things getting hidden or deleted, even if it's the, the actual person that posted it when they delete it, because I, I am a um, customer of Archive Social, so I know that it's all getting saved and it's all there if I need it. So another thing that we've been playing with that we found some success is uh, Snapchat ads. So they're a little more expensive than boosting a post, but I've, I found that um, in our 13 to 30 age range, um, we're not really reaching that group of people very often. So last year we did a opioid awareness campaign in September where the whole county went purple. And we ran this ad for about four days over the weekend. And the Snapchat advertising team was super helpful helping me set up this ad. So I did use um, an action item where I'm asking people to join the, uh, the movement. And when you swiped up on the ad, it took you right to our Queen Anne's County Goes Purple page, which had um, information about substance abuse, resources, and um, all kinds of information. So um, I'll show you the, here's the analytics from that. So over a four day period, I had 1,634 people swipe up. And this is what the analytics look like that Snapchat will give you. So I think that that's pretty successful. Like I said, we're a very small county. So if there was 1,600 people under the age of 30 that I reached um, with this one, this one ad over four days, that's 1,600 people that I've probably never reached before. So we're exploring using Snapchat ads for um, any of our programs where we really want to target that age group. So, and just to show you a couple of examples from the photos that I explained earlier that I use a combination of different things to make my graphics. So here is one from my personal photos. My family is from Punxsutawney and have always been members of the Groundhog Club. So I always celebrate Groundhog's Day on social media. And so here's one of my graphics from one of our trips to Punxsutawney um, celebrating that day. Then over on the right, we've had a lot of hot weather this summer and so i needed a new graphic for um, signs of heat illness and i just took my water bottle out of my bag went out behind my office and took the photo and put some of the signs for heat illness and so i've been able to use this graphic a lot and i, I just find that personalizing it even if it's a photo that people can see it's obviously from your county or your city with your seal on it, it just makes a huge difference and a lot more engagement than just using the generic stuff that uh, people have given you from FEMA or the state or other national organizations. So here's one, um, we had a blizzard a couple of years ago and I got to work remotely from um, at my home instead of going into the EOC, but I needed pictures of the snow. So I sent my fiance up the street with his camera and made him take pictures for me to, uh, post with my updates and I've been able to use them a ton. This was for a Christmas parade detour. So I used some of our blizzard pictures and just plopped a free Santa in there. Um, over here to the right, that's actually my Christmas tree from a couple years ago. And I just used that in addition to the safety tips. So here's a couple more that um, were based on suggested graphics. I think I got in my FEMA toolkits. Uh, fire pit safety, that's uh, my backyard and my son and his friends. And then there was another graphic we got about fireworks this summer and all I could think of was operation. So I made my own graphic using the little operation guy. More pictures that I use my own photos um, just because I have a little more freedom and I, I don't have to get permission to use them and I know exactly, I take a lot of photos so I always have something. So another thing um, that's really can help with your engagement is something unique or a spokesperson. So something unique for our county, um, our 911 center adopted a dog about a year and a half ago. And so we use her a lot for our pet preparedness 
office messaging. So, and the staff at the 911 center is really great about dressing her up or sending all kinds of different pictures for me for whatever it is that I'm planning to post. So I mentioned our um, opioid awareness campaign where we go purple. So last year, Desi, the DES dog went purple uh, for September and said all the cool cats, never mind dogs are doing it. And there's her dressed up for Halloween with some Halloween safety pet tips. And here's just a couple that I've made for um, from the copyright free sites uh, for events or just regular preparedness messaging. Another thing I like to do, just like the snow picture that I've used for lots of different uh, things, is I always take a pictures um, at any events that we're attending, outreach events, EOC activations, and I use them for just about anything. So the picture of the different uniforms working together, I love any shot like that where I can get the officers, our EMS people, our volunteers all together and you can see the different uniforms. So this was actually during a 10K race a couple years ago, but you can see I used it here for our um, fireworks celebration um, because all the same agencies were working together that day. So another request I get that can be a little bit difficult um, is multiple photos. Years ago, it used to be I could do an album on Facebook and we would still get engagement, people would share it, and it seems to sort of fall flat anymore if I post an album. So I've tried a couple of different methods of posting multiple photos. So one thing I, I do is just making a collage of the photos and so it clearly states what the event was and when it was. And then the other thing that I do is uh, making the Kyoza videos. So I've got a video here to show you. Um, we were celebrating, let's see, okay, that one, it is our emergency services folks were at our local 4-H fair and they sent me a whole bunch of photos from the fair. And so I, I uh, did a video. So that was just an example of using multiple photos. It had a lot more engagement than, like I said, just posting um, an album. And you can't really use all of those uh, photos on the other platforms. So, and using your resource, that's the other thing I wanted to um, just stress to everybody, whatever resources you have in your county or city, use them. We're really lucky that we have a video department that is our local access channel. So um, I can get them to do professional quality videos for us. And I found the best results are if you provide the graphics, the photos and the logos that you're using for your social campaign um, and being very specific on what you want and even providing a storyboard and a script. So I have an example here of a video that they did for me for a um, project that was a regional project with our 911 centers. So I'm gonna go to that now. So they did a really great job on that video for me. And um, we used all the same graphics, images, and it was, a, it was a, a really great campaign. So, and the last thing I really wanna stress to everyone is analytics. Um, <clears throat> I do pull our analytics every month. I use it to see what worked, what didn't work. Um, and it's also a great way to save numbers. Uh, I use it for my budget packages, um, for grants. Anytime I'm in a meeting and I'm working on a project and they say, we need measurable outcomes for our grant, I always raise my hand, I can get you measurable outcomes from the social. So um, analytics are, are great. I don't really stress about the actual number. I just like 
to see if it's going up or down each month. So and I, I think that's it. So I'm going to turn it back over. Awesome. Thank you so much, Beth, for sharing all of those great best practices you learned from listening to your community and getting feedback from them. It's been really awesome, again, to get to know you over um, a while. And, you know, of course, hear this story from you today has just been fantastic. Before I hand it over to our next presenter, I just wanted to remind everyone quickly that we do have a question and answer session at the end of it. You still have time to in enter your questions into the questions section of the control panel, so don't hesitate to let us know what you're thinking, what you're curious about, and what you'd like to learn more about. So moving on, our next speaker is Anil Chavla. Anil is the founder and CEO of Archive Social, and he's a national speaker and subject matter expert on the legal policy and records management issues facing agencies like yourselves that are driving social media and government. Um, Anil's been on stage at 3CMA, NAGWA, GSMCon, and Government Technology. And if you all are not familiar with Archive Social, Archive Social is the number one provider of social media archiving government. Over 2,000 public agencies are customers of Archive Social, and that includes New York City, Chicago, Dallas, and smallest towns and 40 plus states. So, Anil, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Erica. And thank you all for joining us uh, on this wonderful Wednesday. I hope you're having a good end of your August. And really uh, want to say thanks to Beth for that presentation. Uh, I came in excited about the, the feedback aspect of it, um, which is really central to social media in that two-way conversation. And I think we're all leaving with a, a, a bag full of tricks that expand uh, beyond uh, just surveying to how you really engage your audience and keep them involved and how you can create graphics um, and keep that social media presence really lively in a very um, low resource uh, manner. So, so thank you, Beth, again, for covering so much of that content on this important channel of social media. So what I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so on is to dive deeper into a few items that Beth mentioned along the lines of uh, legal requirements, record keeping, the, the fact that your social network like Facebook can hide content for you, the fact that your, your citizens might delete their content. What does that all mean? How does that play into this important channel? And uh, I'm going to touch on some of the legal situations that we've seen in the space that can be problematic unless you're proactive. And so we'll talk about what you can do to be proactive, how to protect the channel so you can keep that feedback flowing. All right, and so the, the, the underpinning of this discussion, it hopefully is something that you've heard about before, not, not a new topic for you, is the notion that what you say on social media and what's said to you is public record. Um, all, all of us in government, we're well familiar with public record, the importance of public records to to really facilitate the transparency that, that we all look for in government. Well, that of course applies to social media, just like it applies to your email, to your other documents. Again, this was a question when social media really took off in government four, five, six years ago, uh, pretty well established in the space today. But again, social media is evolving, it's dynamic. And the laws that require that record keeping, the public records law in your state is probably decades old. And so I wanted to put you to a resource here if you're if you're if you're all familiar with this this the notion of social media as a public record, but not quite sure exactly the latest and greatest of, of what you should be thinking about, or if it's actually a new topic to you. If I just hit a light bulb there of wait a minute, social media is a public record, I wanted to share this resource right out the gate, bit.ly slash SM public records. We created a map of the United States where uh, regardless of which state you're in, find your state, click on it, you'll see both the, the law from uh, your state that's been there, uh, your public records act, your sunshine law your right to no, no, no act, whatever, whatever it's called in your state, um, it, they're fundamentally at, at the core, of the, uh, at the core um, all about keeping records of, import, of government communications sent and received that pertain to your public business, and social media is right in the middle of that now. So check that out, and just to give you a sense of how much uh, has evolved in the space around the legal requirements before we get into some of the case studies, I want to mention uh, just one example from, from Massachusetts. I know, I know several of you today are attending from Massachusetts. We have folks from across the country. The guidance has gotten really clear uh, and has provided a lot of instruction to agencies. And in Massachusetts, they have this really great document, the Electronic Records Guidelines document, great in the sense that it protects your agency, protects the channel, tells you what you need to be thinking about. And it really calls out the fact that social media providers, Facebook, Twitter, and others, um, aren't set up for government record keeping. Right. When you look at the policies, the terms of service for these, these social networks, in fact, they're inconsistent or in conflict with your record keeping requirements. And so you have to recognize that for the vast majority of social networks, 
the obligation to maintain records to be in compliance with your records law sits in your hands as an agency and that you're obligated to take affirmative steps. So again, Massachusetts is very clear on this. Again, other states have addressed this in a similar manner. Check out the map. Uh, and then of course at Archive Social, what we can do is offline help you um, further understand how those legal requirements and guidelines apply to your specific use of social media. Um, but a good, great starting point for you to check out that resource. Now let's take this to reality. Uh, so to, we'll pick a different state, Pennsylvania, uh, interesting case law out of late, late 2017. Uh, the borough of Chambersburg uh, faced a situation where they received a public records request for content that had been deleted off of the mayor's Facebook page. Now, this is particularly important because, as we all know, the, the elected officials, the public officials, uh, they're, they're in the spotlight for good reason. Um, and many of them, again, they're elected, so they're political, politically oriented, and there's controversy in politics today, if you hadn't heard. So policy, that, that, that policy um, baseline, the, the, the difference of opinions, is really showing up on social media in a big way, particularly with these elected officials. And a lot of agencies have approached this, um, understanding this happening, but not really thinking that the elected officials um, are a, a, a major issue for the agency itself. They might get you in the spotlight, get you some bad press. You're gonna guide these elected officials to try to, to be smart on social media, but ultimately what happens um, and whatever challenges they receive are challenges they have to deal with and you did your best to tell them about it, right? Well. We've seen now a number of uh, uh, situations in case law where what an elected official does can come back to you as an agency. Chambersburg is a perfect example. They received the records request for content deleted from the mayor's Facebook page, checked around a little bit, talked to the attorney, responded back saying, you know what, we're not responsible for this records request because uh, the mayor's Facebook page is the mayor's page. We didn't create it. We don't control it. Go talk to the mayor. And um, this is actually challenged, taken to the courts, um, all the way up to the Pennsylvania Office of open records, um, which, which decides how the public records law applies. And the Office of Open Records ruled that because the elected official is a, uh, a, a, a public official conducting public business, a public records request can be issued to the borough and the borough is responsible for fulfilling it, regardless of their involvement with that page on a day-to-day -day basis. And so follow on to that, the, the, uh, having received this ruling, Chambersburg agreed to release the mayor's deleted Facebook posts. Again, this is late 2017. Several months later, after agreeing to release the posts, uh, the council decided, well, we don't have them. They've been deleted. Let's go to Facebook for those. Um, and again, this is several months later now. Um, that's the latest that we have as an update. I'm going to come back to this uh, question of can you go back to Facebook now to, to ask for deleted content? Uh, foreshadowing on what I'll tell you is no. But I'll explain to you why that is and how you can get ahead of it, right? And how you can be in a situation where you're not going to Facebook and how this kind of circumstance is not something that, again, threatens the channel of social media that is so vital for getting information out and getting feedback. And going back to, to Beth, uh, located in Maryland, um, some really interesting case law out of Maryland, again, not related to, to Queen Anne's County in any way. But at, at the state level, um, it's important to pay attention to these things because uh, when, when something happens at the federal state level, it, it does it does trickle down. It does affect the local levels, and um, this is a really interesting case because no, numerous, uh, several I should say, governors across the country have faced a similar situation where um, citizens have felt like their First Amendment rights being infringed. They've then faced a lawsuit, and what's interesting about this is that powerful interest groups like the ACLU are getting involved, and not only at the, at the state level but even at the local level. And this is a case that was actually resolved with a settlement. And um, after the governor was sued for, for removing this content, again, alleged, uh, the, the folks suing him alleged that, that uh, the, the, face, the, the First Amendment rights were being infringed on the Facebook page. They actually came out with a new social media policy um, uh, that was agreed upon between the ACLU and the governor's office. It cost the governor's office $65,000 to, um, to, to pay for the plaintiff's legal fees. And they, in, in this new social media policy, they had to agree um, as part of their different um, uh, requirements there that they would retain content for at least one year. So again, these First Amendment concerns, when you talk about feedback, not all that feedback's positive, you may be inclined to remove some of it. You have to be careful on how you do that, and that's a whole other whole nother topic. But in situations where content does get removed, whether you remove it or the citizen removes it, that can then show up in a legal situation. And so really important to think all that through in terms of your policy, how you approach it, and of course, the ability to produce records when the challenge comes in. So speaking of challenge, challenges um, and, and challenges requiring you to produce records, having your social media records can be challenging. Uh, and it's because of how social media works. Unlike email, unlike your other documents, 
This is not something your IT group controls. When you set up a Facebook page, Facebook controls it. They own it. It's out there in the ether and uh, you know you can access it and so forth. But even while you're sleeping, content shows up on your page. It gets added, edited, deleted. Um, and really there's no guarantee again that Facebook provides that they're going to retain your content. And I'm using Facebook as an example, but this is true for all the social networks. And what it actually boils down to is whatever's there is there. And if it's not there, then you have a problem. If it's edited, deleted, gone, it's gone, right? And, and that's not um, a great position to be in when it comes to your records management requirements and your, and your, and your public records requirements. So social media provides this re real challenge that it's sitting out on these third parties, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and others, but you're required to have the records. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So when I get into what you can do, I want, you, I want everybody to understand how important of a problem this is. So one way is I could keep talking about this, the reality that Facebook doesn't have the record for you, but the, the better way, as, as again, Beth alluded to in terms of measurements and, and the measurements that she does internally on a monthly basis, is to really measure the size of the problem. And so that's what we've done here at Archive Social to talk to you about what, what is the real risk of losing a social media record. This is a pretty eye-opening study. So what we did is we looked at 500 different public sector customers, uh, both public you know, cities, counties, state agencies, uh, the normal public agencies you think of. And we include school districts in there as well. Um, many of you on, on the line today are from a school district um, facing public records requirements. And so 500 public agencies and school districts. And we looked at how much social media was communicated uh, for these agencies in one year, in all 2018. And a pretty awesome stat here in terms of how, how important social media has become. Over 10 million social media posts, both sent and received by these 500 customers in one year. And when we conducted this study, it was almost six months into this year, it was in May of 2019. And so we we're looking at, okay, all the content that transpired across 2018, five months into the next year, how much is still on the social network? Well, it turned out that 500, or sorry, 758,000 of those posts no longer were on the social networks when we looked at it in five months into the next year. So how, let, let, these are big numbers here. So let me boil this down um, to what, what this really means. For each of those 500 agencies, uh, school districts, that's an average of over 120 communications lost per month out of 2018, or boiling it down even further to make it really crystal clear, one out of 15 social media posts gone five months in the next year. Literally, if you were to pull up your Facebook page right now, you're probably looking at about 15 posts and comments. Imagine six to 12 months later, one of those is gone. You scroll down, do that again, one of those is gone. So that's a pretty high ratio of content um, being lost and, uh, lost and no longer available on the social network. So, so important to recognize how much data loss is occurring. And if you're wondering, well, how, how is all this data disappearing? Uh, it, it, is a, it, it can start as uh, simply as someone hitting delete, but when you look at social media today, it's a conversation and it's, there are threaded comments and it's quite involved. And so in this example, we have a citizen here, Sabrina, that, that's commenting uh, with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And there's a number of ways that content can be deleted, including the fact that Sabrina could delete this top level comment, which would not only delete her comment, but delete all the responses to it. So all of those in one swoop, uh, the six communications you see right there can disappear with the click of one delete button. More than that, a citizen can then uh, choose later on in the future after they've engaged with you for a long time that they've had enough and they're ready to quit Facebook or quit the social media site that they're on. And because social networks are really set up to pr protect user privacy, when you say you're done, they will delete everything that you've said. So you as an agency can lose a whole treasure trove of records and communications in one swoop when a citizen decides that they're no longer going to participate. So a lot of ways that this content can disappear. At the end of the day, you do have to think about how you're going to maintain those records and protect your agency. Again, as Beth alluded to, there's, there's a number of benefits to having records, including the ability to, to go back and search your archive for something that you posted last year and around the same time. And uh, maybe you have a Labor Day post that you want to pull up again and use. Or if you have a legal situation, you need to have it. A lot of different reasons to have the records. Um, but there are generally three ways that you as an agency can, agency can fulfill your records requirements. The first is just to rely on the social network and hope it's there. The second is to uh, manually try to keep records. And this generally boils down to taking screenshots. And the last is to use some kind of technology automated archiving software to do it for you. And so I wanted to share this matrix with you. I won't go through all of it here, but um, it's really important to recognize that by and large, unless you have some technology doing this for you, 
Uh, there's a lot of record loss that happens. You're going to miss on, on, on content that gets posted and deleted quickly. You're going to miss on edited content. You're probably not going to have uh, what's known as metadata, which can be really critical for legal situations. The searchability of screenshots is, is pretty limited. So a lot of restrictions here. So you have to really think about how to, how to keep these records. And it does come down to finding the right technology. Now, um, you have different options out there. And here's a framework for how to think about those different options. But one thing I want to really point out is that when it comes to social media records requests, something that we've seen quite a bit across the country, um, we see records requests now for social media content, both from a public record standpoint and a legal standpoint, very regularly with, with the customers that we work with. Um, it's one thing to say you have the data. It's the other to be able to produce it. And social media um, really means that you're on different platforms like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and others. It's often conversational. There's multimedia. And so when you look on the left here, um, when you're responding to a records request, it's not good enough to be able to just spit out a mixed bag of, of posts from different social networks. You really have to be able to reconstruct and replay what happened on social networking. So on the right, we actually have a real records request that, that a customer of ours um, responded to. This is how they responded. Um, and the technology um, was able to highlight the content that matched the records request, but it reconstructed it without, within the overall conversation that happened. So again, um, it's, a, it's, it's a challenging problem to keep the records, but there is technology out there to solve this problem. And you have to be smart about the technology use so that you are positioned to actually be able to respond in a, in a meaningful way. So I, I'm going to leave it at that on terms of the technology. Um, a lot of benefits to having the records, uh, being able to respond to records requests. Certainly when it comes to content that gets deleted, again, as Beth mentioned, that's something that Facebook might be doing for you automatically. It might be that your citizens are doing it. Um, and uh, this will really empower you to you know, having record keeping really empowers you to remove inappropriate content that should be removed while still meeting your record keeping requirements. And finally, you can centralize oversight um, in one place and have that search engine of social media that gives you a lot of visibility. Um, it really is uh, a question of risk and benefit for you. Um, and what we really wanted to share here is you have different options on how to approach it. Um, it really depends on what, what risk your agency perceives, the case law around you. And you have to make that calculation. For those of you who are wondering what archiving software looks like, though, it is very low cost, typically a discretionary spend under $5,000 annual, sometimes half that cost. Um, but, but, but again, evaluate your options. And that's something that, of course, we can help you with offline. I did want to share just one more uh, success story with you before we get to the Q&A as we're running out on time. And I wanted to share this because we often talk about the legal situations, the records requests, the lawsuits. We see a lot of those. We can tell you a lot about those in the vicinity that you're in. But here's an interesting one out of Massachusetts, a small town that we work with that's a little bit different. And, we, and this is really important because it's all sorts of reasons why you should think about your social media policy and how you keep records. And in this case, the customer is using a, 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 a scheduling software. Um, uh, Beth mentioned using Hootsuite. Software like Hootsuite can schedule posts for you to Facebook and Twitter, really useful. In, in this case, for, for this town, there was a glitch that caused some of the, the, the scheduled content to get posted and then deleted automatically. And so the director of technology saw this happen. There was no legal request yet. There was no issue. But they saw this happen. Content got posted and then got deleted. And that's not what they intended. And so interesting things like this happen all the time. And because they had the record keeping, they, they were able to, to, to figure out which posts those were and repost them. Um, and, and the director of technology says, Look, if we weren't archiving, this could have been a disaster, right? And so that's what this is all about, is preventing the disaster and being able to focus on this channel and make the most of it. So we've today given you, uh, um, you know, the chance to, to hear from Beth, which, uh, which for all of us was wonderful. We, we took, again, a lot of tips away from Beth, I'm sure. Um, but also wanted you to be aware that there's two sides to the equation. It's all the great stuff that happens on social media, all the benefits, but you have to get ahead of it with your, your policy planning, your record keeping. Records requests are coming in. And you do need to get ahead of it now because when it when you when you do need to produce a record, it may be too late. Um, and so that's something that we can help you with at Archive Social. Again, wanted to lay out the, the 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 legal circumstances with you. If you're at all interested in learning more about it, that's a conversation we can take offline. We're happy to give you a phone call. And where we like to start is really to to fill you in on the legal landscape and how that connects to how you are actually using social media. So if you do have questions about the public records requirements I mentioned, that's something we can help with. If you want to hear how other agencies like Queen Anne's County are approaching archiving and why they chose to archive, we have over 2,000 agencies that are archiving. I'm sure we can find one or two around you to talk to you about it. Um, and then when it comes to record re requests and legal situations, if you're surprised about that, um, a lot of the record requests and legal situ situations we see don't become headlines. They don't become lawsuits because these agencies 
are already archiving, they have the right policy. We can tell you about what, what happens so you can be better prepared. Um, if any of that's interesting to you, go ahead and launch, uh, go ahead and answer this poll. Let us know what you're most interested in. We'll give you a call. Um, this is not a product pitch. This is really about us being a resource to you first and foremost to fill you in on what your agency should be thinking about. And then if we can help you from there, we, we can go from there. But uh, go ahead and answer this, and I'm going to hand back to Erica so that we can answer some of these questions I've rolled in. Yeah, and Neil, thank you so much for giving us the full download on everything. Um, I have several questions here. So we're going to dive right in. Beth, the first one is for you. Um, this question is, I'm interested in getting feedback and increasing participation, but want to avoid the snarky or downright rude comments of the residents. What tips do you have for building a more supportive community? Okay, so um, a couple things that have worked for me. Um, I definitely try to reply um, only once. If you keep engaging the people that are being snarky, um, it just seems to kind of like keep going on and on. But I like to reply with a very kind of normal response of if you'd like more information, here's a a uh, link to our website where you can read more about it. I also try to take it offline where I invite them to come to a meeting or to call someone on the phone so they can get more information. And then the third thing that I try to do is, um, you know, if all else fails, I don't engage with the people. But if it, they have a legitimate question in between the snarkiness, I'll answer it. Fantastic. And one more for you real fast before I have one for Neil. We're toying with the idea of creating niche groups on Facebook for our constituents to engage with one another and us on specific topics. What do you think about that? So that's something I've thought about as well. I have not explored that at this time. Um, we have a couple of main community groups that are extremely active and I've kind of fallen in the thoughts of why recreate the wheel. My content's getting seen by a large number of our citizens by using those community groups, but um, it's something that I might explore in the future. I was actually thinking about maybe using it for CERT, for our CERT training teams. Um, so I'll let you know if uh, if I tried and if anyone else has tried it, let me know. Okay, great. Um, and then Anil, for you, how does Archive Social deal with video content? Well, video, video is an essential part of your social media. It's an essential part of the public record. Uh, it fits a thousand words. I'm not quite sure what we've ever come to say what video is, but it's really, really important. And so across the board, um, Archive Social does capture video on all networks. One of the interesting trends, in fact, has been live video, and that's something that we've been uh, very early to support and, and handle for our customers. Um, so it's handled, um, and it's something that, that um, uh, we know is core to how our customers communicate. All right. Beth, we have one coming in from folks that are listening live. What kinds of survey questions do you use and how do you report your statistics when you don't know who specifically is responding? So um, I feel that we get more feedback if people do not have to log into our website and tell us who they are to answer. So um, we just, I'll use an Excel sheet to capture all of the answers and just use as a general that we surveyed this many people and say 50% of the people answered yes to this question or no to that question. Um, I try to keep them simple. Some of the most successful surveys we've had have been just about four questions. Um, I like to either give a few uh, responses for them to pick from, from with maybe a fill in the blank or a yes or no question. Um, keeping it simple seems to get the most engagement. Okay, fantastic. Um, Anil, we have one for Archive Social. So one issue we've had is of other people, namely First Amendment auditors, deleting their posts on our site. Right now, Archive Social shows the post that was deleted, but not who deleted it. Are there any plans to capture that information? This is a great question. First of all, appreciate uh, having an Archive Social customer on here with us. And you highlighted a really big issue, this, this notion of uh, these, these auditors, these folks that um, go on a mission to, to really test agencies to see how they're dealing with First Amendment and how they're dealing with public records. We've seen that across the country, not only in Texas where you're at, but New Jersey's in our big state where we've seen that happen quite a bit. And um, the question about knowing who deleted was it you or the agents, uh, you or the citizen? That is not something that gets recorded in the social media record by the social network in the metadata that they expose in any way. So the short answer is that we are we are limited to what the social network provides. Um, that metadata I mentioned is something we get. It's just not in the metadata. 
We've had this question come up quite a bit from our customers. Fortunately, we haven't seen a case where it's actually uh, been requested as part of the records request or in the legal situation, but it is in, in, an interesting um, question. And so there are some, some tactics in, in our tool that you can use. If you're deleting something, for example, really easy to go into the archive, annotate it with a tag to say that you deleted that record. So in the future, if the question comes up, you know you've deleted things. You can have in clear policies as well, really, really important. When you look at the record in the archive that's no longer on the social network, you can still see it in the archive. You can match it up to your policy and be able to say, you know what, this matches a, a, a violation of our policy. It's likely we deleted it. So there are some, 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 some things that you can do out, out of band of the record itself to help give you the appropriate context. Um, and that's the best that we have today, but certainly if the social network start exposing that information, that's some information that we want to get in our hands and into your hands as soon as possible. Well, fantastic. Everyone, we are at the top of the hour. I want to take a minute just to thank both Beth and Anil for joining us today and sharing their insights and information with everyone here as well as with me. Um, again, we will be sending out some information as follow-up to everyone that joined us today. If you have a specific question that was not answered that you'd like for me to connect you with Anil or Beth to answer, please don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, thanks everyone again and have a great rest of your Wednesday.